it would be impossible for me to summarize everything I discussed in part one. So I recommend you click right here, here, right here, or here. That's the same place as here. If that's not possible, then click down there, right down there, or over there. Why didn't I think of that earlier? This is very important because some of the stuff I discussed in part one will be discussed here in this video. This video that's about to start now. Here and now. Here we go. Where did we leave off? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. And so it becomes your task to help Alfred find the way to the castle. And luckily for you, on the very stretcher you start the game on is a summons to the castle. Oddly enough, it's addressed to you. This is just one of the many few supernatural aspects of Kanehurst you will notice with no real logical explanation. When you arrive to Hemwick Charnell Lane, a stagecoach arrives with a phantom driver and takes you there. This whole scene was inspired by the classic book and 1931 movie, Dracula. Complete with the ominous horse and hurried carriage ride, scenic shot of the castle, the ride in, and even the phantom driver. I say driver. What do you mean by going at this? Even gates and doors mysteriously open upon your arrival, beckoning you to enter, just like in Dracula. Because of these ties to Dracula, we can safely assume the queen has some hand in bringing you here despite being locked in a battle. If the fact that the horse is being completely unmanned is weird enough, when you get there you'll see the horses are frozen and long dead. Even the carriage looks old and unused, with ice covering it, worn from the weather. And even more queer is the fact that the road you were driven in on is completely decimated. We can assume Yarnum is across the water and over where the... over... yeah, where the clock tower is, right there. But it makes it pretty obvious there's some sort of supernatural aspect to the summons, and it's only with the summons you can get here. Talk about a fortress! Not only is it surrounded by water, but there are no roads in. No wonder Alfred can't find it, but standing around doesn't help his matter much. Or does it? Perhaps he is so quick to buddy-buddy with every new hunter and hopes one will bring him a summon to the castle so he can finally carry out his task? Maybe? Upon entering the gates to the castle, you'll find many mosquito-like monsters. It's obvious they were vile bloods at one time, judging from the silver-gray hair who overindulged in blood, so much so they turned into blood-sucking beasts. There are three variations of them ranging in the size of their bellies. The overbloated and fat bloodsucker won't even attack you. In fact, it turns away from you to hide its face as if ashamed of itself, which I find very interesting. It's as if these aberrations retain their humanity but attack at any chance to feed, unable to control themselves. This is a good glimpse of what happens to many Viblebloods who are unable to control their bloodlust. There are many statues strewn about. Most are very oddly placed or crumbled to the ground in a state of disarray, likely from the siege on the castle. Once you enter the castle, you'll find delusional servants hard at work maintaining cleanliness, but attack them once and they'll show you no mercy. Some will spot you and attack you unprovoked. Kanehurst Castle is haunted by the ghosts of the slain during the siege of the executioner. You'll find many female noble vile blood ghosts wielding daggers littering the interiors. It seems many of them had their throats ruthlessly cut. A story can be ascertained, especially in the dining areas. It seems some inspiration was derived from the Game of Thrones red wedding scene here. As they were sitting for a feast, executioners possibly rushed the place and slit all their throats. There's even a few headless ghosts that were likely beheaded in death. I mean, they were killed by executioners after all, and executioners are known for what? Beheading. In examination of the environments, you can tell there is certainly a lot of history within the castle. The statues depict that of kings and queens, nobles, naked ladies, and especially that of babies or potential heirs. There was definitely a medieval monarchy system in place, likely before the Kanehurst nobles were corrupted and decimated in war. Then, if you look closely enough, you'll notice some seemingly normal gargoyle heads protruding from the walls, some broken off, but wait a second, there's more to it! It seems a jester is seated in the lap of it, almost as if using it as a chair. Either from software has a sense of humor, or... This means something too profound for me to begin to explain. You may notice the Kanehurst symbol of the two back-to-back -back rampant lions present everywhere, even on the Kanehurst badge. Lions in heraldry are commonly used to represent strength, courage, and royalty. When lions are depicted facing each other, it represents support and camaraderie, but the Kanehurst badge depicts the lions facing away from each other, which represents patience and prudence. Considering how close they are, if not overlapping, it means they have a lot of that, which fits very well with what we know and what we will soon learn more about the queen. There's an expanse of light 
library that takes up nearly the entirety of the castle, not to mention the entirety of the game. The reading material you see littered all throughout the game are symbolic to the quest for knowledge, insight, and enlightenment from the higher deities. You'll eventually encounter Logarius. Just like the chariot and horses from before, he is frozen solid. It's as if it has been ages since he has encountered an adversary. He is guarding the queen, but definitely not to protect her. <laughs> oh no! Rather, he holds this area to ward off people trying to consult with her, and to prevent the corrupted blood from spreading further. And get this, Logarius is dead, man or undead. His spirit is trapped here and you are setting him free. So don't feel bad having to kill him. Though killing him ain't as easy as it sounds. He's a giant, strong, and nimble man. Once defeated, it may seem like a dead end, but you'll get his crown. The description of it makes it clear as day. The king died and he took his crown that is capable of revealing illusions. Logarius then donned the crown to prevent anyone from finding the mirage it hides behind his makeshift throne. And when you put it on, it reveals an entire new area that happens to be where the queen is hiding. As if hiding the entire castle wasn't enough, someone had to hide the queen's chamber too, all through supernatural means that are impossible to explain. But all are possibly influenced by Harry Potter, a known work of influence for the creator and director of this game. In the books and movie, there are protective enchantments, one of which that can chameleon specific places or objects for a long duration of time. There are even illusory walls and doors which have been used time and time again in Dark Souls as well as the Bloodborne's Chalice Dungeons. When you make your way up some stairs leading to the Queen's Quarters, you'll notice statues of knights on horses seemingly constructed to protect the quarters, but it also shows a bit more of the history of the castle before being forsaken. When you arrive, you'll notice a single individual sitting on one of two thrones. This is Queen Annalise of the Canehurst Vilebloods. Upon entering, you'll hear her say, Visitor, I claim no subjects, but here lieth our throne. Kneel afore us or get thee gone. Even to an outsider, in the ruins of the forsaken and uninhabited castle, she maintains her age-old customary and authoritative nature and will not speak to you directly. In fact, she addresses herself in third person. Such impudence. Defiled are we, yet still queen. We shall not give audience to an ill-mannered beast. Perhaps she speaks in third person so she doesn't have to face the fact that her king, among many other nobles, are dead. You know, she has no problem admitting she's defiled and all along I just thought this was an insult. But in order to speak with her, you must kneel in her honor, subjugating yourself to her. Visitor. Moon-scented hunter. I am Annalise, queen of Castle Canehurst. <laughs> Ruler of the vile bloods and sworn enemy of the church. She says it very clearly that she is a sworn enemy of the church, but why? The church was originally in the practice of good blood through blood saints, but partook in old blood in communion. This could be because the church were enemies of their practices, creating a feud that's literally good versus evil. The gold blood gem makes it very apparent that members of the church partook in old blood in communion, then started turning into beasts quite suddenly and frequently, possibly when the blood became tainted. This, and what Alfred said, reinforces my belief that the vile bloods may have had some involvement in the tainting of the healing church and the proceeding epidemic. Yet our people are murdered and we are prisoner to this wretched mask. She confirms that the executioners did indeed murder everyone and that she is trapped in a desolate and forsaken ruin alone. It's apparent in her speech and tone she has never fully dealt with the reality of the fall of her kingdom. What is it thou art in search of? If you swear to the vile bloods, she calls out how strange it is for a hunter to wish to become defiled. Well, well. An odd hunter thou art indeed. We've tired of these piteous nights. Share in our plight and take oath against the church. If thou wouldst this path walk, I prithee partake of my rotted blood. If you refuse, she actually tells you that you're wise and brushes you off completely without even trying to get you to reconsider. Considering her only wish is to birth a child of blood, you'd think she'd try harder. The more vile bloods to help her cause, the better, right? But I guess not. Or perhaps it's a form of pompous reverse psychology. A wise choice. 
there is no more to be said. Away from mine gaze. If you do become a vile blood, you must partake in her corrupted blood. It doesn't do anything to you, and even when using the oath, Alfred doesn't treat you any differently afterwards. Very well. Drink deep of our blood. Feel the spreading corruption burn. <laughs> Now, thou art too a vile blood. We too, the very last on this earth. What I find very interesting is that she mentions that now only you and her are the very last vile bloods. This is probably true for the moment, but you do see a vile blood in the cathedral at the end of Eileen's quest line that will fight you even if you are a vile blood too, complete with the armor and oath. Why would a vile blood fight another unprovoked? Well, the rune he drops should explain it. It mentions that it resonates with the servants of Queen Annalise, and that they crave the queen's blood and want nothing else in return. Vile bloods will slay other vile bloods for their blood drugs out of greed in order to have a drink of the queen's intoxicating and corrupted blood. Since you defeated Logarius and exposed the illusion hiding the queen, other hunters now have easier access to the queen, allowing her to rebuild her army, as ungoverned and ruthless as they are. With the corruption oath equipped, you will get blood drug drops from any other hunter you kill. Return to the queen and give her one. Thy gift pleases us. Let this reward be thine. Indulge thyself in our tainted blood. And you will get a chance to drink in her corrupted blood once again. There is definitely a prominent theme of glutton and greed in this game, especially here. I mean, look at the Kanehurst bloodsuckers who got so obsessed and addicted to blood, they transformed into monsters that represent their desires. Look at the Healing Church's clerics who know they will turn into beasts, yet still overindulge in corrupted blood. You can continue giving on Elise as many blood drugs as you please, but it only adds you to a vile blood register, an in-game leaderboard. No matter how much corrupted blood you consume, nothing changes in the game's lore. So have at it! Drink till you're fat! Arrant fool. Vile blood or no, forget not. We are thy queen. Bend the knee. Vile blood or no, respect will be shown. Kneel. Now you must also take into consideration her Old English. Nowhere else in the game anyone talks like this. This is because we are to assume she is really old. But also we are to assume at this point that the Executioners and Vileblood siege happened a long, long time ago. Logarius should be pretty good proof of that. I mean, he's pretty decomposed, and in the cold, that process is slowed even further. This fact calls into question Alfred, who is much too young to have ever met Logarius, and as we are led to believe, is the only Executioner alive. This is likely because he joined the Covenant long after the fact an adoration of its history which later turned into full-blown worship for Logarius. Now there is a theory going around that must be addressed regarding the Thumerians and their possible connection to Kanehurst and the Vilebloods, as it has absolutely no foundation. The Thumerians are a race of humans that have lived underground in labyrinths beneath Yarnum for luckily hundreds or thousands of years, as evident by their albino-like and deprived appearances, and have established their own cities that you can visit through chalices. They were first to discover the slumbering Great Old Ones, and were able to harness their insight and learn many things from them. Now they exist to protect the great beings that reside below. They, like Kanehurst, have a monarchy system in place with a female as a queen and burial habits similar to ancient Egyptians. There's no evidence they ever rose to the surface. A theory found online by Seeker of Fire, which I assume was the origin of the widely accepted epidemic, misinterpreted an item description, thus taking his theory on a misguided path. The item description says the Thumerian monarch was traditionally a woman who assumed a name with classical roots. That means whoever became the monarch either already has or takes on a name of an already existing city, such as in the case with Queen Yarnum. He thought that the monarch established the city of Yarnum, but that is not what the item description says at all. You see Queen Yarnum's apparition on two occasions as symbolic hints to the storyline, and that's all. She shows up to tell you that she lost her baby, that she's sad about it, and that her baby is Murgo. Deep within the dungeons, there is a very rare ring of betrothal in a sarcophagus. In the description, it says it's only permitted by the Great Ones to those slated to bear a special child. This was assumingly gifted to the Thumerians, who likely helped populate the Great Old One's race in exchange for their powers and extended lives. The Thumerian Queen Yarnum was the one who actually gave birth to the special child named Murgo. It was taken away from her and nursed by a Great One within a nightmare. The ring was really meant for someone like Queen Yarnum, but there is no way to propose to her, no matter how beautiful. 
and tall she is. Her pale skin really glows in the moonlight. Considering Queen Annalise is planning to birth a child of blood, one can assume he can use it to propose marriage to her, too. So, I say, there is no evidence backing the theory that there is a connection to the Themerians and Vilebloods. When you finally muster up the courage and propose to your sweet Queen Annalise, she says, Oh boy, oh boy. Speak not those words. We have little need of a consort. Such a path would be like lead to further ruin. Further ruin? Thou art dear to us. We would see no harm befall thee. No harm befall me? Man, talk about a rejection. Makes me wonder what exactly would happen if we were wedlock. I can't even begin to theorize. Though you can try again. <laughs> Ah, still thy honeyed tongue. The thought alone sufficeth. Thy worth is too great. Now, speak no more on the matter. Well, her compliments that time did make me feel a little better. Look, Annalise, I, I, I just met you and this is crazy, but it was fate for us to be together. The very moment I set my eyes on you and your disfigured mask with possibly something else disfigured underneath, I just knew. I knew you were the one for me. Together, we don't have to be alone anymore. As you said, we're the very last two Vilebloods in the world. I defeated Logarius, which wasn't easy by the way, to have audience with you. I swore your oath fought your battles, blessed you with offerings, and drank upon your corrupted blood only to be closer to you. May I have your hand in holy or non-holy, whatever works for you, matrimony? <laughs> Honestly. Well, screw you then. We await thy return. Oh, I'll be back, all for right. For the honor of Canehurst. Oh, what's this? An unsigned Canehurst summons? I wonder what would happen if I put Alfred's name on there and gave it to him. Oh boy, I could only imagine what he'd do to you. For good measure, I might even add, Come at me, pretty boy. Think you got what it takes to handle a real woman? Aha! Uh -huh. Is that the sigil of Canehurst? Yeah, yeah, she even called you an impotent pretty boy. You can't stand for that. I've heard tell of Canehurst nobles and their amusingly pompous invitations. Wonderful. I thank you profusely. I will depart immediately, but first, a token of my gratitude. I agree, you should totally do something about it. Ah. Wait, what are you doing? I feel my master's hand at work. Praise the good blood. And let us cleanse these tarnished streets. It has been an honor, but I must say goodbye. Let us cleanse these tarnished streets. And may the good blood guide your way. We can assume once you give him that summons, he takes off to Hemwick Charna Lane in a steaming rage and boards the carriage en route to Canehurst Castle. When you go back to Annalise's chambers, you'll stumble upon a grisly sight, but it was the right thing to do, and she definitely deserved it. She wouldn't marry me. Master, look! I've done it! I've done it! I smashed and pounded and grounded this rotten siren into fleshy pink pulp! There, you filthy monstrosity. What good's your immortality now? Try stirring up trouble in this sorry state. All mangled and twisted with every inside on the outside for all the world to see. <laughs> You got it. Queen Annalise is immortal. A vampire. Topping off the whole Dracula reference. Alfred should have just thrown garlic at her and plunged a wooden stake into her heart, for God's sake. Now you can understand Logarius' motivation, why the war has been at a stalemate, and why he didn't just off her. And that's because, well, <laughs> he couldn't. Annalise is probably the only immortal vile blood, but why? I cannot answer this. Even when looking at her splattered remains, it writhes eerily, suggesting that she's still alive, even in the gruesome state Alfred left her. <laughs> oh. Oh. You, is it? Look at this. Thanks to you, I've done it. Well, isn't it wonderful? Now Master can be canonized as a true martyr. <laughs> I've done it. I have. 
<laughs> Alfred is ecstatic because he completed his task. He canonized Logarius as a true martyr and is now the last remaining executioner, making them the victors. On top of that, the vile bloods have been wiped out completely and the source of the corrupted blood will end with the death-like state of Annalise. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Annalise back together again. But maybe you can. Alfred will then return to the executioner's shrine, sadly, to sacrifice himself in honor of Logarius after a prayer. He cleansed the tarnished streets of the source of the bad blood and felt his task was complete. If any one covenant in the game could be considered good by making a positive difference in this world, it'd be the executioners. Logarius once said, we shall always strive to be good. You can see Alfred place the Canehurst King's crown on the altar in memory of Logarius who wore it for years to guard the Queen's whereabouts. Its significance is profound. But wait just a frickin' second. I have that very crown in my inventory. Where the hell did he get a second one? That's a fake! E oh, okay. I won't question it. Why bother? You can aggro Alfred at any point in the game. Before giving him the summons, he'll just say things like, Oh, why are you doing it? Cut it out. Stop it. And when he dies, he says, Oh, you'll regret it. But there's much more dialogue when you aggro him after defeating the queen that's of more interest. Just what is the meaning of this? Why turn your blade on me? You're jealous, aren't you? Unclean witch! Vile monstrosity! Bloody fool! Has the blood gone to your head? Pathetic! As you deserve! Get the blood! You spilled my blood! It feels kind of bad making him angry and hearing him yell at me. When you die, he says this. A hunter's grudge is an awful thing. You must find your own way on this hunt. As I have mine. <laughs> He's just so mild-mannered about it and even throws a little lecture at you. Oh, you'll eventually find your way. Oh, no hard feelings. When you kill him, he says, Pray for Master Legarius in my stead. Oh, now that's, now that's just damn depressing. As he couldn't go pray for Logarius at the shrine, in his death, he asked you to in his stead. Wow, what a really great guy. Confirmed for best character in Bloodborne. <clears throat> okay, I promised Alfred I'd do this, so here I go. Uh, Logarius, uh, I'm sorry I killed you. Okay, but I, I do have to say, you put up quite a fight. You sat for ages defending a corrupted immortal queen. Not many people can say that, man. Oh, and also, I am sorry I killed Alfred. You know, um, I really, really, really regret it. He was a good guy, too good for this world. Uh, let's see. Uh, I got, I think I got, I got some scripture here. I, I th actually think you wrote it. Uh, you said, acts of kindness are not always wise and acts of evil are not always foolish. But regardless, we shall always strive to be good. You said that, man. That's like Gandhi shit. As most of you already know, if you want a second chance at marriage with Annalise, you can grab a piece of her flesh, preferably a good part if you know what I mean, from the throne, take it to the Altar of Despair, and feed it to the corpse Rom that served as Abriatus's altar. By the powers of the cosmos imbued by her saturated, corrupted old blood, time flows in reverse for the flesh, and when you return to Annalise's chambers, she'll be sitting there like nothing ever happened and everything will go back to the way it was, completely making all of Alfred's work and suicide for naught. Annalise, I fed your boob to the corpse of a spider. I gave you back your life. Now will you marry me? <laughs> Honestly. Okay, you know, how do I unreverse your death? You can try to kill Annalise on your own, but it takes a lot of consecutive or big hits. Perhaps her health slowly regenerates, but I'm not sure. After beating that vampire silly, she'll fall over and you can hear her panting and breathing heavily. <sighs> But when you leave and come back, she'll be flesh putty again, making it so that you have to go out of your way to revive her once more. When back to her original self, she'll nonchalantly say, Well, well. Thou wearest a second face. She quickly forgives you. <laughs> With a chuckle, even. It matters not. Our flesh is undying. Speak thy mind. And things go right back to normal. Damn it, I failed Alfred. The nicest, kindest, handsomest guy. But maybe I should have just married him instead.
then maybe he'd have something to live for. And maybe he wouldn't have gone and killed himself. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, and one more thing, Logarius. I, I know, I know, this doesn't concern you, but uh, Alfred, if you're if you're listening, I think I, I don't know. Uh, I liked liked you. It, it's okay if you don't didn't feel the same way, but uh, I had to get it off my chest. Dating a vampire just sounded really cool. I mean, like really, really cool. You have to admit, you can't fault me. But to be honest. I really wish you didn't have to die. You're you're like the coolest person I met in Yarnum. Thanks for watching this information-packed two-parter Bloodborne lore on one of my favorite quest lines in the game. For more on this take of humorous lore analysis, subscribe to my channel in order to not miss any other detailed videos and or become a super patron like these amazing people. You can also get your name listed here with a small pledge to this time-consuming hard work. A special shout out to Martin, a new supporter. By all means, check out these other great lore videos of Soulsborne games. Please watch them if you haven't, and share to get the word out. And a big thanks to the 53,000 plus subscribers. You know who you are. Give yourselves a pat on the back. I'd do it, but that would be impossible. Also, you know, Logarius. Yeah, yeah, I know. I keep coming back to pray to you, and I'm sorry. I might be overstaying my welcome, but I'm heading off to the kingdom of Lothric now. I I've been there, and I have to say, it's pretty good. It's not as scary, but I do have to say, it was a wild ride, and everything I've experienced here was just phenomenal. I definitely will be coming back sooner or later, but hey, maybe next time I won't kill you and Freddy. Uh, yeah, that's what I call him now. Uh, you know, I couldn't choose between Al or Fred, but you know, I just settled on Freddy. So, you know, hate to say it, but goodbye. Uh, goodbyes are forever. It's kind of the issue I have with saying goodbye. <sighs> Bitch.